to Mark. Uh, again, I second uh, what Mark said in welcoming uh, Mr. Hemen Haurami to the Middle East Institute. We are very pleased to have him here to share with us his perspective on a number of issues, uh, some of which will include uh, uh, the ongoing uh, battle against ISIS, uh, the latest developments, where we are, where we, where, we have, where we are, where we are heading to, and in relation to that, the issue of IDPs and refugees, which is a, uh, a big issue right now for the KRG, relations with Baghdad, uh, issues of independence, uh, and intra-Kurdish issues, relations between KDP, PYD. And I've asked him to do all of this in 20 minutes. <laughs> and then we can open it up for discussion. But before I turn the floor over to him, because I don't want to take too much of his time, uh, just let me do a quick brief introduction. Uh, Hemen is the youngest member of the Kurdish, of the Kurdistan Democratic Party uh, Leadership Council and the head of its foreign relations office. Born in 1976 in the town of Halabja. He is no stranger, I think, personally uh, to the, uh, to the uh, tragedies that the Kurds have suffered over the years, especially under uh, the reign of Saddam Hussein. Graduated with a BA degree in, Engli in English literature in 1999 from the University of Erbil. He was previously active uh, in the Kurdistan Students' Union from 1989 to 2000 served in the office of KRG President Mr. Masoud Barazani from 2004 to 2011. And uh, uh, in 2010, I think, he was elected to the Leadership Council and he has headed the party's foreign relations office for the last four years. So please join me in welcoming him in to the Middle East Institute and to this conversation. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Thanks, and I would like to thank you all for being here today with us. It's a great pleasure to be here and to discuss about this important issues, and I hope that I can cover it with 20 minutes. If I can make it short, it's the end of Iraq, and the things are solved, but it's not like that. Uh, concerning the, I will start by discussing about the war on ISIS, where we are and where we are heading to. All of you, you know what happened and how it happened and why it happened, so but I would like to report to you that from our perspective, this war is going to be a very, very long war. It's not going to be ended in the coming years because ISIS is the symptom of the illness. It's not the illness itself. ISIS is the result and is the product of the failed and the failing states in the Middle East. We in Iraqi Kurdistan region, when ISIS attacked Kurdistan, we developed a three-phase strategy. The first one was to stop ISIS. The second one was to roll them back and the third one is to defeat and destroy ISIS. I can proudly report to you that 100% we managed to stop ISIS, and we managed to also 95% to roll them back from the areas that they occupied, and we managed to liberate 20,000 square kilometers from ISIS. But on the third phase of the strategy to defeat and finally destroy ISIS, up to, no, up to this moment, we have lost 1,225 pe brave Peshmergas in the fight against ISIS, and we have 7,000 wounded Peshmergas also. But with all of that success from Iraqi Kurdistan region as the real force on the ground to defeat and to destroy ISIS, ISIS is gaining elsewhere. ISIS is gaining. They gained Ramadi, they gained Palmyra. So it means that there is no comprehensive strategy to defeat and to work in a unanimous way to defeat ISIS everywhere or to have a comprehensive military and strategic plan against them. The other issue that we say is a continuous war. So far from August, 19, August 2014 to July 2015, based on our information from our Ministry of Peshmerga and with information also from our partners, we have killed 11,000 ISIS in the war with Peshmerga, with the airstrikes and the face-to-face -face on the battlefield. But within that space also, they have received 10,500 new foreign fighters. So it means that also, by not stopping the source of their foreign fighters, this fighting is going to continue. Kurdistan has been a responsible, active, and reliable partner in the fight against ISIS. So Kurdistan, in this regard, needs more. The strategy of fighting with ISIS, we do believe that in this regard, by su support for the Kurdistan region, military support, and humanitarian support, but especially this related to ISIS, enough 
is not being done toward Iraqi Kurdistan, especially to equip the Peshmerga forces in the fight against ISIS. Why we need more? Because ISIS literally outguns Peshmergas. ISIS has more access to modern and developed weapons that Peshmerga has. So that's why we need, really need to outgun ISIS, not to have the balance with ISIS. And for this regard, when we say we have not received enough support yet for this, uh, uh, for this fight against ISIS, because the type of the fight against ISIS is different from any other types of the fight that we have ever seen as Peshmerga forces on the ground. 73% of our casualties, of those 1,225 Peshmergas, were killed by IEDs and by suicide bombers. So it means that the lack of anti-tank armors, the lack of APCs, the lack of armored personnel carriers, cost us a lot. So that's why Kurdistan region needs more anti-tank armors. It needs more long-range high-power rifles. It needs tanks. It needs artilleries. It needs, it needs different types of the rocket ammunition to, def to, to defeat this terrorist organization. It needs, for example, so far we have received only 40 MRAPs, mine resistance ambush protected uh, vehicles, 40 only. But imagine our needs in the Ministry of Peshmergas. We need 400 of them in order to deploy our Peshmerga forces around. We need aircraft, especially for transporting and for the medic evacuation helicopters. We need transportation tracks. So all of that, unfortunately, this kind of the support for the Iraqi Kurdistan for the Peshmerga forces are there in a very slow process, and we needed to expedite it. We need greater special forces engagement, especially by targeting, directing actions, and by training of the Peshmergas. We need support to advise and mentoring to, to reform and to modernize the Peshmerga forces in Iraqi Kurdistan region to be a new capable military partner with the United States, with the other members of the global coalition against ISIS. The other issue that we have because of the ISIS is the surge of the IDPs and refugees and the burden of this in Iraqi Kurdistan region. Right now, in this moment that I'm talking to you, we are in Iraqi Kurdistan region providing refugees and safe haven for 2 million IDPs and refugees. Imagine in, in June 2014 to August 2015, we had an increase of 28% of our population. 28% of our populations. 80% of them are in Dehuk and in Erbil provinces. Unfortunately, here I'd like to say that enough has not been done to support the KRG in dealing with the IDPs and with the refugees. And now it's costing also, it, it's, it's, it's maximizing the pressure on the host communities in many areas. We in the KRG and the Kurdistan leadership, we need $282 per an IDP and refugee for a month to provide with the services that they need, with their education, with the hospitals, with the other services that they need. Unfortunately, Baghdad is hardly doing anything to support uh, our, our government and to support their own citizens who are in Iraqi Kurdistan region right now. The United Nations and NGO are operating hand to, mouth, hand to mouth and they need more. These people need emergent care that we have in Kurdistan for the short term. But in the long term, ISIS must be solved and these people must return to their own original places. In this regard, that's why the fight on ISIS, the burden of the IDPs and refugees, Kurdistan needs more to be, needs more support in all respect. Coming to the relations with Baghdad, my dear colleagues, since 2003, we in Iraqi Kurdistan region, we have done our best. We have done our best to have a federal, democratic, pluralistic, constitutional, inclusive government and to have to, that, that will be based on the power sharing. Very frankly speaking to you, Iraq is broken. And Iraq is not going back to, uh, to be as it was or can be governed as it was before June 2014. We have a completely new Iraq right now. Iraq is not going to go back to prior of 2000, June 2014. But Kurdistan has not done this. It was not us who has done this to Iraq. And it's time to the world to realize that a failed system needs a review. A failed system needs a review. As I said, we have tried our best, and even for the government formation with Prime Minister Abadi, we did an agreement with him. We did an agreement to form the government. 
We supported him to be a new prime minister for all, to undo what the wrongdoings of prime, former prime minister Maliki. And also we did an agreement with him in December 2014 for the oil issues between us and, and the Iraqi government. But here I would like to report to you that unfortunately, his government has not fulfilled the agreement and the promises that we have agreed on. And he has not also fulfilled the, the, the agreements that, uh, that they had with the Sunnis also. On the December agreement, we agreed to, to ship 250,000 barrels of oil from Iraqi Kurdistan and 300,000 or 300,000 also from, OU, from, uh, from Kirkuk's oil fields. In return, Kurdistan should have received 17% of the Iraqi budget plus the budget for the Peshmerga forces as part of the Iraqi defense system. But he would like to say that, unfortunately, that the Iraqi government has not abided by that agreement, that in April and May and, and even in June, we have pumped more than what we have produced and, 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 and agreed on. And uh, I, I heard from Ashti Arami before coming here that the Ministry of Natural Resources shipped more oil in May. That's worth one, $1 billion for a month, but the Iraqi government only sent $400 million for the Iraqi Kurdistan region. With that burden of the IDPs and refugees, as I said, we need $282 per IDP and refugee to provide them with the services that they need. With this 1,100 kilometers border with ISIS, that's a very costly war, and this is the relation with Baghdad. Unfortunately, Baghdad is not fulfilling its obligation toward Iraqi Kurdistan. Baghdad has not sent anything for the Peshmerga forces in terms of budget and even and most recently in terms of the shipments of the ammunition that they need. They claim that we don't have enough cash, but they have cash for PMU, for the Popular Mobilization Unit. Now in Iraq, we have approximately 150 different militia groups. 46 of them are well known. They are commands and they are, their, their operational leaders are known. Their structure is known and they receive $800 a month for every member of the Popular Mobilization Unit. So there is money for them, but there is no money for Peshmerga forces. <coughs> so that's why we need to put back that to fulfill their obligation, if they want, if they want to fulfill their obligation. Our message is that Baghdad must be committed. If not, please do not interfere with efforts by Kurdistan to fulfill our own financial responsibilities toward our citizens and toward these refugees and the IDPs toward this continuous and costly war that we have with ISIS. On the issue of independence, ladies and gentlemen, here I'd like to speak very frankly and very honestly that this is a process, it is happening. It's not something that we have a plan, we might think about it. It is happening and it's going to happen. But he would like to say that this referendum that we are going to, and we, we, are, we have a plan to do it in the very soon, when I say very soon is less than a two years, let's say. This referendum is for all Iraqi Kurdistan citizens. It's not only for the Kurds. So the plan is that through KHA, Kurdistan High Election Commission, in coordination, if they agree with IHAC, Iraqi High Election Commission, to hold a referendum on the Ira for, for all Iraqi Kurdistan citizens, including Arabs, Turkmens, Yazidi, Yazidi Kurds, whoever lives in the Iraqi Kurdistan region, to simply ask them a question. You, as the Iraqi Kurdistan citizen, what do you want? An independent state, an independent state then to have a confederation with Iraq, or do you prefer to stay as a federal region within Iraq? So with that, when we do this referendum, the first capital that we are talking to will be Baghdad, because Baghdad is important for us. We wanted to do it in an amicable way. We don't want, we, we want to add to the stability in the areas, and Kurdistan is the anchor of the stability in the, in the area as we are seeing it right now. I would like to say that we don't have any pan-Kurdistan agenda. So when we are talking about referendum, it's for Iraqi Kurdistan region. It's not for the other parts of Kurdistan because they have their own different kinds of the context, geopolitical equation, different types of the system. So what we are going to do is for Iraqi Kurdistan region. And by that, Iraqi Kurdistan region, because this is first our legitimate right, second, the argument is Baghdad is a failed state right now. The sectarian fighting between the Sunnis and the Shiites, the lack of national army, the increased numbers of the, uh, of the sectarian forces in Iraq, 
And with this failing and failed stem system in Baghdad, we don't want to be part of that un unknown future. We have done our part from 2003 to be in a federal democratic constitutional pluralistic Iraq. But unfortunately, Iraq right now, we have representation in Baghdad, but we don't have any power sharing in Baghdad, and we don't want to be part of unknown future because we are responsible for our citizens, for the future of our kids, and we want to be part of the stability and to keep Kurdistan region as the villa in a jungle within that instability that we have it in the area. So for the other intra-Kurdish issue, uh, as you may be aware that right now in Iraqi Kurdistan domestically, uh, we are in the negotiation process concerning the term of President Masoud Barzani and how the Kurdish political parties are going to solve this issue in Iraqi Kurdistan. But here I'd like to just give you a bit brief background about where we were in this issue, where we are right now, and where we are heading to. As you know, in 2003, we had an election in Kurdistan region, and we in KDP, we won the elections, and we have 38 seats in the parliament. We could have easily formed the government without the change movement in Kurdistan. We could have easily secured 57 seats in the parliament and to form the majority government. But we strategically made that decision that this is time for Kurdistan to have a broad-based national unity government. That's why we approached the change movement, who have 24 seats in the parliament, with the UK and the others that all collectively to go through this critical time of our history. President Masoud Barzani was elected in 2005 uh, by the Iraqi Kurdistan parliament. And at that time, we in the KDP, we wanted to have a direct public vote. But IHAC at that time, they said we cannot be ready to do that. That's why we agreed to have the election within the parliament. So the president was elected in parliament. Five minutes, OK. Then, part of the, later that they became opposition, they were challenging us, they were saying, oh, KDP is afraid of public vote, that's why they agreed with PUK to elect their president in parliament, so they cannot do the public vote. We asked for the amendment of the law, and President Barzani asked for that. In 2009, we had a public vote, and President Barzani was elected by 70% of the, the voters in Kurdistan. So in 2013, as you know, we had also a draft of constitution but unfortunately, this draft was not uh, passed in the referendum because they, they, the other opposition party, they wanted to have a consensus on the draft of constitution. So lack of constitution and also the presidential law number one of 2005, that was amended in 2009, stipulated that the president will be there for two terms and he will be elected in a direct public vote. But he was elected first by parliament. So there was a legal issues and the, whether that the first term is regarded as the term is not. And we haven't had the draft. So that's why we and PUK together, we extended the term of president for two years, but with a big but, to have passed the constitution within these two years, to prepare the constitution in a consensus way. President Barzani himself issued a statement, said that, I have to take the responsibility of President Talabani because he's not around, and in one year, I want this next parliament to, 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 to solve the issue of the constitution, then to have the election for the president based on the constitution. Unfortunately, the current parliament, they couldn't make that constitution to be passed within that year, so that's why we approached to, to this moment, and in this moment, President Barzani did his legal obligation by calling for election 60 days before the end of his term. So he called for election to be held on the August 20th, 2015. But the KEHA, Kurdistan High Election Commission, they said we can't do this election in August because technically we are not ready yet. And the other political parties, PUK, Goran, and the other two Islamic parties, they provided parliaments with a draft to amend the presidential law uh, and the main purpose is to have to not to have the public vote, but to have the election of the president within the parliament. So we in KDP, we have started our diplomatic efforts in the last couple of, let's say, days and week. And our suggestion for the other political parties, we prefer a public vote in Kurdistan for the president. It's not for President Masoud Barzani. It's not a personal issue. He's president, after one year, two years, he may not be president. But the question is to have a checks and balance between the parliament, the president, and the prime minister in Kurdistan. It's not a presidential system in Kurdistan. So in order to, if we can't do elections by August 20th, that's the KHAC said we can't do election. And if we are not going to solve these issues by consensus, 
then we are going to have a constitutional vacuum by August 20th. To avoid that, we, we offer to other political parties three solutions. That has been discussed with the political parties in a uh, KDP's high-level delegation led by His Excellency Nature Van Barzani, the, the Vice President of the KDP and the current Prime Minister of Kurdistan region. First, we prefer as KDP that President Barzani can stay for four years, but as a transitional four years. In this four years, we need the draft of constitution to be agreed because we have a committee for it. And uh, within that four years to hold the referendum for the self-determination of Kurdistan region, if the other political parties don't agree on that four years, then we ask that to extend President Barzani's term to the end of the current term of the current parliament. It means by until 2017. If not, then we are going to, uh, this is one of the suggestions that we are going to, uh, to call for an early parliament election in Kurdistan and the government to resign. And then, based on what the other political parties say, the majority minority, then at that time we can do both the presidential and parliamentary election. On the issue with relation with PYD, because this is the final topic that I have, uh, I'd like to report to you that since 2011, with, with the start of the Syrian situation, we had a consistent policy. And that policy is based on unifying the Syrian Kurds, hosting them, supporting them, supporting them diplomatically and even militarily. This has been our consistent policy from the beginning. For us, the unity of the Kurds is the most important issue. And we also wanted them that the Kurds in Syria to have their own agenda, not to be part of any other agendas, or the Iranian agendas, regime's agendas, Turkish agendas, just to have the Kurdish agenda within the Syrian revolution that we have. In this regard, President Barzani hosted the Syrian Kurds, and we monitor the negotiation between PYD and the other Kurdish political parties. We had the Erbil One agreement in July 2012 for them. President Barzani supervised this agreement. Then we had the Erbil Two agreement in December 2013 to solve the remaining issues between PYD and the other Kurdish political parties. We had also another agreement for them, the Hook agreement in October 2014. But I'd like to report to you that unfortunately, PYD has not abided by the three main elements of all of these three agreements. The joint administration that we ask them to do, the joint military force, that all Kurdish military force to be united in one command and control, and also to have one political reference as a, as a supreme board for, of, of the Kurds for Syria. And we told them, with that three issues, if you can agree, if you are going to negotiate with the Syrian regime, we don't have any objection. If you are going to join the Syrian opposition in the fight, we don't have any objection. Whatever you do, just be united and do it together. But unfortunately, PYD has not abided that agreement, refused to have joint administrations with the other Kurdish parties who are part of the Kurdish National Council. They refused to allow the other Syrian Kurds who have been trained, about five to 6,000 of them, to join the, the, uh, the, the, the Yepaga forces in the area, and up to now, they, won't, they haven't allowed the, the, the political references, which is al marjaiya Siyasiya for, uh, for the Syrian Kurdistan, for the Syrians to be there. So here I would like to say, our policy is consistent. We don't want to copy-paste Iraqi Kurdistan experience on the Syrian Kurdistan. We don't interfere in their own affairs, but we want their unity. And as you know, militarily and diplomatically, sending Peshmergas to Kobane uh, and opening up diplomatic relations for PYD is the genuine effort from us, from the Kurdistan leadership, that we want Syrian Kurds to develop their cause within the, the Syrian revolution, but our condition for them is their unity. So with this unity, I will end my speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. What a comprehensive and in illuminating presentation in 20 minutes. Okay, really <laughs> a, a, a very impressive feat to have been achieved. Uh, before I open the uh, uh, floor for questions, let me just quickly extend a special welcome to Ms. Bayan Sami yeah. Rahman. She is a KRG representative in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for joining us today here at the Middle East Institute. Uh, I will open the floor with my question, with one question to, uh, to Hemen, and then we'll take questions from the floor. And that has to do with uh, the issue of independence. Um, 
when you were talking about independence, you said the first capital we will be talking with about independence will be Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And my hunch is that the next two capitals you need to be talking with about independence <laughs> are Ankara and Tehran. Of course. And so from your perch as head of the KDP Foreign Relations Office, mm -hmm. uh, what can you say about these conversations? Have they been taking place? Where do you think these two capitals are on the issue of mm -hmm. KRG independence? Yeah, uh, I can't speak on their behalf on what they're concerned about the independent Kurdistan, but I know that our policy and strategy and even discussing after Baghdad with them is that Kurdistan is not a source of threat for you. Kurdistan is not going to pose threat neither to Ankara nor to Tehran. We don't want to copy paste what we have in Iraqi Kurdistan for the Kurds in Iran, for the Kurds in Turkey. We prefer a peaceful solution for the Kurdish issue inside Iran, inside Turkey, and we will do whatever is possible to be part of that peaceful solution, to bring them about, to help in any kind, as we did with Turkey. But we are not going to be part of any military security solution for the Kurdish issue, and we don't prefer prefer that and we, we reject really that military security solution for the Kurdish issue both in Iran and in Turkey. Another thing that we like to tell them that we in Iraqi Kurdistan, as I said, we will be adding to the working states in the area. We will not add to the numbers of the failing states in the areas. So we have a lot of common interest, economical interest, uh, common values in keeping the stability in the areas and Iraqi Kurdistan as an independent st state will be a great partner. For example, for Turkey and even for Iran, for Turkey, if Iraqi Kurdistan right now, even without being a state, is the second largest market for Turkey after Germany. Out of 3,300 foreign companies that we have in Erbil, we, uh, uh, we have almost 1,300 Turkish companies. The same with Iran that we like. Our message is that we don't pose a threat to you. It's our legitimate right. We want to be a good partner with you, and there are a lot of common interests that we can work on it. Thank you. Phoebe. We are going to be passing the microphone around for the sake of taping. Yes, please. Um, uh, Phoebe Marr, an independent scholar on, on Iraq <laughs> at this point. Uh, thank you very much for that tour de d'horizon. That was really wonderful. Um, speaking about the potential for, for independence and potential problems with the neighbors, um, could you address some potential problems internally? You presented a, a, a fairly unified picture of uh, Kurdistan, understandably. Um, how about the PUK and rivalries therewith? Uh, how about Kirkuk? And what we, uh, of course, what you and everybody is, is, is facing is challenges from a border with ICE and the sure. new Shia militias in control, or pretty much in control on the ground uh, in much of your region yeah. mm -hmm. up there. Yeah. Uh, you know, despite all the political differences that we have with PUK, with Goran, with the others, but for this strategic issue, we are on the same sheet on music. So it's really for the strategic issues of the national issues, for independence, for the self-determination, there is no difference. Maybe there are differences of timing or some tactical the priorities here and there, but on that, that we are going to do it, yes, we are going to do it very unitedly. So this is a, a very important issue for all of Iraqi Kurdistan. For the Kirkuk issue, I, I forgot to say that in our plan is, and, and that's why we need help from everyone, and from you, from the United Nations, from the, from the United States, that we are going to hold two referendums, one for all Iraqi Kurdistan, wherever they are, even the Iraqi Kurds, the 18,000 that I told you in Nashville, to ask them. I did not say that. Yes, you should say that. I wanted to mention it. The single largest Iraqi Kurdish community is, is in, in Nashville, 18,000. Yeah, so they will be asked what they want. And after that, the second referendum will be for those former disputed territory areas to ask specifically the citizens in that area whether they want to join this Kurdistan or not. So there will be two referendums. That's why we don't want to impose any military status quo on any border that we have with ISIS. Just to have another referendum, as it is part of the Article 140 of the Iraqi Constitution. Uh, for the Shiite militias, that's part of the issues that we are concerned. Yes, we are concerned about some of the Shiite militias on those border areas. And most recently, the Khorasani um, Hajj al-Shaabi group, they have been deployed around to Sukhurmatu and the other areas. And they have kidnapped four bodyguards of the president, Iraqi president, Fuad Masum, And they have done some, some, some things in that area. But in generally speaking, 
issues, uh, we're going to discuss this with the Shias in Baghdad as well. So we are not that much concerned about the Shia militias. Uh, I'm Firas Maqsad, adjunct professor at University of Maryland and director of global policy advisors. Uh, let me second Randa's comment by commending you for an excellent tour de force. You really helped break down the different challenges fa facing Kurdistan, whether military or political. But I want you to take it a step further. Uh, I want you to take it into the realm of policy prescriptions and, and do so if possible from a, from a Washington perspective. As you probably know very well, there was a, a proposed bill in Congress yes. that would uh, compel the Iraqi government in Baghdad to give a certain percentage of the assistance, the military mm -hmm. assistance it was receiving to Iraqi Kurdistan. Yeah. Uh, that legislation was opposed by the administration. Mm -hmm. And the administration is trying to strike a delicate balance between maintaining its good ties with Kurdistan, but also those with uh, the Iraqi government in Baghdad. If you were sitting in Washington, how differently would you go about striking that balance? Yeah. Uh, we are, I know maybe some people they don't like it, but we are really very grateful for the all the provides and the support that we have been given by the United States, and it has been very, very crucial. But as I said, enough has not been done, and we need more. When we say we need more, it's not only for Iraqi Kurdistan. The strategy to, to defeat and degrade and destroy ISIS cannot achieve its strategic goal with the current implementation of that strategy. We need more weapons for Iraqi Kurdistan, for the Peshmerga forces, and also for the empowering the moderate Sunni uh, forces in the area, because ultimately they must be the vanguards of defeating ISIS in their own areas. So our policy and our recommendation are always that the consistent policy is that we prefer a direct shipments of arms for Iraqi Kurdistan without any delay in Baghdad, because we don't receive, I will give you two examples. We did two big operations, one uh, in, uh, in uh, near Aski Musul, in December and the other one near Zamar and Delaita. We asked Iraqi government, it's two big corporations, you know, that we managed to, to clean 3,000 square kilometers from ISIS. They haven't sent a bullet to Peshmerga, just even a bullet for us. So that's why this delay, the timing and the quality and the quantity is not helping us to destroy and to defeat ISIS because as long as ISIS stays in Mosul, in Ramadi, they will pose threat to Iraqi Kurdistan. It will continue on that effort. So for, we do believe that one Iraq policy is a failed policy. And it's not helping to defeat ISIS. We must have a comprehensive strategy to empower the Kurds, the moderate Sunnis, and to rebuild an Iraqi national army that will be loyal for that Iraq altogether. But keeping everything through Baghdad, I don't think it is helping. And in, on the ground, it's not helping us. Imzadad from the University of King's College. Uh, you, brought, you mentioned up the, uh, the different presidential terms that Mas'ud Barzani has taken. Uh, Mas'ud Barzani has been president of the KDP region from 96 to 2005 after the Civil War. He was then elected in 2005 and then again 2009 and then his term was meant to be up in 2013. It's been extended for two years and now you're, bring, you're mentioning another four years. This is all from 1996 and uh, is not him the only one who's in leadership. His nephew is prime minister. His son is head of the, the security council. His other son is a commander. His nephew is also commander of the Peshmerga, also at the same time head of the Korak Telecoms. So I'm, quest I'm wondering, uh, what are the aspirations of Barzani and the KDP mm -hmm. for a democracy? You continue to uh, talk about failed state in Baghdad, but mm -hmm. you know they've had four leadership uh, transitions peacefully with the KDP, hasn't had since 1991. Thank okay, you. thank you. First, to correct your information, <coughs> President Barzani has not been president since 1996. He was the president of the party, but not president of the region and until 2005. Second, in 2005, he has been elected by parliament. The third one that you mentioned in 2009, he was elected by the people, so by the direct public vote, 70% of the vote. And the question is not concerning Masoud Barzani right now. When you say about the nephew, uh, Mr. Van Barzani, KDP won the largest bloc in the parliament, and it's up to KDP to nominate who will be. Mr. Van Barzani was deputy prime minister to Dr. Roji in 1996, so it's not a question about them or not. And you talked about the son who are commander, they are commander of Peshmergas. They have been wounded in the battlefield. So who else? Is Maliki's son in the battlefield like the others? Or the other leaders, their sons are also in the battlefield fighting ISIS? This is the question. They are commanders, but they are fighting. They are with the Peshmergas in that area. The question, as I said, it's not about Barzani. The question is, our question to the other political parties, who are your candidates? 
We like to know who are the candidates of Goran for presidency, who is the candidate of PUK for the presidency. Lack of candidate and lack of the implementation of the election by CAHEC. President Barzani asked for election, called for election. What else he can do? So that's why it's not about him. We say it's, a, it's not related to KDP alone, it's related to all political parties. Thank you. I'm Stanley Kober, MAI member. Um, you mentioned the losses the Peshmerga yes. have suffered. And Hassan Nasrallah, a couple of months ago in a speech, said, we are involved in a war of attrition. Mm -hmm. okay? Attrition involves not only the losses, but the ability to replenish the losses. Mm -hmm. The Islamic State replenishes its losses with outsiders. The outsiders come through Turkey, by and large. So this raises questions. You're right next door. What do you think is going on now that all these outsiders continue to replenish the IS ranks? What can be done about that? Because if that isn't choked off, you're going to have a big problem if this is a war of attrition. Uh, I completely agree with you because that's why I said it, it needs a comprehensive strategy to involve all. You know, if any country in the Middle East believe that they are immune from ISIS, they are wrong because they are going to pose threat to them as well. The, any threat to the regional stability will cause instability in any countries in the area. So no one can say. Unfortunately, I would like to report to you that right now all of the, those who are involved in the fight in ISIS against ISIS are not on the same sheet on music to look at ISIS as, as posing threat for the regional stability. Some they look at it as a geopolitical asset that they can use it against their own geopolitical rivals in the Middle East, which we do believe this is a wrong calculation because ISIS is posing threat to all of us in the area. So all must be me in the strategy to defeat because their financial support, their, as I told you, 10,500 foreign fighters within the last, uh, since August 2014, Definitely, it's, it's very clear where they are coming from. So that's why we need them to act more and to be more responsible in contributing by cutting the source of their foreign fighters. Uh, thanks, my name is Nick Boros. I work with TD International. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I just want to preface, I totally recognize that the rise of the Islamic State has been a horrible thing for the KRG. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, casualties, terrorist attacks, loss of Kurdish youth going to join the ranks of ISIS, all that is horrible. Um, that being said, I do think there have been some almost twisted benefits for the KRG as a result of the rise of IS. Uh, there's greater recognition that the KRG is an important regional force. Mm -hmm. um, we had the temporary oil deal, which although imperfect, at least saved off financial cliff. Um, and also there has been territorial expansion. Uh, what ways do you see the KRG advancing its own interests in the future fight against Islamic State? Thanks. Thanks for the question, but uh, we are not opportunistic, really. You know, it's not a question of benefiting from ISIS. No, we have lost 1,225 Peshmergas. The life of one of them equals to all the other things that I mentioned. The second one, for the territorial expansions, we have never done the territorial expansions. It was the Iraqi government, Maliki's army, that's one my friend discussed that they peacefully handed over to Abadi. Maliki's army surrendered to ISIS and they withdraw from all the other areas. If we we're not in those areas, ISIS would have taken Kirkuk and the other areas. So if we leave those areas, who is going to fill in? ISIS? So that's why it's not a territorial expansion. Uh, our strategy, the independence issue, please, this is very important, is not related to ISIS issue. You know, fighting ISIS doesn't mean that Kurdistan fights ISIS in order to get independence. It's two different issues. Even I, if ISIS can be destroyed in the longer term, and it can be destroyed, but there will be different, I, that doesn't mean that's the end of terrorism in the Middle East. As I said, ISIS is the symptom for the bigger illness in the Middle East. The illness is the failed system that we have, that the borders of the Middle East doesn't reflect the realities on the ground, doesn't reflect the wish and the willingness of the people on the ground. So as long as we have this, we, we must be we, we have this consistent policy in fighting ISIS, destroying ISIS, but on parallel to that also to continue to gain our independence as it's a big right and the legitimate right of Kurdistan. My question is, can you name some steps taken by about the Maliki toward his inclusiveness? And also I have some friends in some what? inclusiveness government. Okay. 
and also I have some friends in Iraq mission in uh, in UN. They have been, you know, kicked out and they were replaced by Shias. Can you confirm that, please? Uh, when I said that, uh, that we had representation but not power sharing because it was not inclusive, I will just give you an example. At the Ministry of Defense, there are 224 different directorate and subdirectors. Out of that 224, we had only two Kurds as the directors. We had only seven Sunnis. The rest were Shias in the area. So that's what that, that's not the inclusiveness. Out of 16 divisions of Maliki's army, we had only one Kurdish division commander and two Sunni division commanders, and the rest were appointed by Maliki himself. So yes, definitely, the inclusiveness is not working in Iraq, and we feel that we have been <coughs> disenfranchised. The Sunnis believe that they have been disenfranchised. And even the Sh other Shia political parties, Iski and the Sadris also, they feel that they have been disenfranchised by the Dawah party as well. How about the Iraq mission? I don't have that information, sorry. sorry. Uh, I have others who would like to ask questions, but also I would like to give the opportunity to the people in the overflow room to ask their questions. I have two questions from them. The first one is from Elisa, Elisa Marcus. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Her affiliation is an independent analyst. Her question is as follows. You spoke about the need for a unified Kurdish force in Syrian Kurdish areas. YPG says it's willing to absorb other forces under one central YPG command and control. Is this acceptable to the, I assume, to the KRG? And if not, why not? First, it's not our job to accept or not. You know, we, we don't interfere. But that was the agreement between Yepaga and PYD with the KNC that both forces, the Yepaga and the Syrian Peshmerga forces, who have been trained together to be in a joint military command to be called the Syrian Kurdish forces, not the YPG or the Peshmerga forces. That has been agreed in the second Erbil agreement and in the Hook agreement. But after the agreement, PYG and the Yepaga, YPG, let's say, they have not allowed the other Kurdish forces, even they have prevented the Syrian Kurdish Peshmerga to participate in the Kobanis fighting. They allowed the Iraqi Kurdistan Peshmerga, but they refused to allow them to be there. So it's not really, as long as this cannot be solved, it's not our job to say we accept or refuse, but that was we have brokered, we agreed on it, to have one central, one Kurdish force command for all Syrian Kurds, whether it's YPG or whether it's in the Syrian Kurdish Peshmerga in Syria. The second question, and she, uh, that person did not put their name, please restate the question you intend to pose in the referendum that you referred yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I said, uh, it has not been finalized, but these are the thoughts that we have. The question will be for all Iraqi Kurdish, Kurdistani citizens. When it, we, we don't want only, it's not only for the Kurdish people who are in Iraqi Kurdistan, so it's that. Whether they want to have an independent state, or to have an independent state, then to have a confederation with Iraq, or to stay as a federal region within Iraq. So these are the three main questions. I, they might rephrase it with words here and there, but this will be the substance of the questions. Sir, yes. Uh, Dave Ottaway from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, yes. My question regards arms coming from Europe to help you. I noticed that the Germans uh, we're sending you anti-tank missiles. Actually, I think they were French anti-tank missiles. Uh, are those arms coming directly to you uh, rather than going through Baghdad? And do the European countries helping you have a different policy about shipping arms directly to you yeah. rather than going through Baghdad? Uh, uh, it's true that it's called Milan. It's French made, but Germany has it. And they send it to us, and they have been very, very effective. Uh, yes, from the beginning, few months of the operation, they send it directly to Kurdistan region. And there are other countries who directly send uh, armaments to Kurdistan. But as I said, the quantity is not enough. And I don't want to, because it's a military information, I don't want to reveal that. But the, 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 the amount of and the quantity of this anti-tank missiles that we have is not enough for 1,100 kilometers border with ISIS. And uh, uh, for the other countries, yes. There are other European countries that have supported Peshmerga forces directly by sending different types of the military aids that we need. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kaki okay. uh, My name is Nama Abdullah. I'm with Rudao, Kurdistan's news uh, channel. Uh, I have two questions for you, Kaki um, If 
uh, I'm sorry, I came five minutes late. I don't know if you Fine. talked about this. But have you made any progress in your uh, negotiations with the PUK and Goran over the future of Kurdistan's presidency? Mm -hmm. uh, do you expect that issue to be resolved anytime soon? Or this could actually be a very serious uh, issue that could destabilize the region? Yeah. Second, what, what was the KDP's view on the role of religion in an upcoming, in a forthcoming Kurdistan constitution? Do you support a totally secular constitution for Kurdistan? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kak Namo. As far as I am aware, with the KDP's delegation, they had very good talks with the uh, Goran leadership. They have also good talks with PUK. And actually, yesterday, a PUK member of Politburo, he was with me uh, in, U in UN, and he told me that we are going to solve this issue in a consensus way. So they understand the, that, uh, that there is no other solution beside to have a consensus way. And, uh, and we are very optimistic, as I said. Maybe there are some fewer details that remain to be addressed, but on that issue, yes, we are very optimistic that this can be solved within the coming months, at least, to altogether. The second one for the role of religions, we, as KDP, as you know, it's a democratic, multi-religious, we have Christians in our leadership. It's a multi-religious, multi-ethnic party, so if multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multi-ideology will be a symptom and for any secular system, yes, definitely. We are not with that to make Islam as the only source of legislation for Kurdistan. Islam or Sharia? Islam, Islam or Sharia, yes. But will it be a source of legislation? It will be one of the sources, you know, as we have it in the Iraqi constitution, but also we, it must not contradict with any, with other religions in, 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 in Kurdistan region, and it must not contradict with the human rights and with democracy and the principles of freedom that we have it in the constitution. Steve Feinberg, U.S. Department of State. Thank you very much for your informative talk. Um, just wanted to uh, raise the question of Kirkuk once again. Yes. Um, we, we hear, um, we, we've heard from some PUK leaders uh, the idea of a special status for, for, for Kirkuk. And was one, I was just wondering, is that something that, they, that, you, that the KRG supports, the idea of special status, mm -hmm. or, is, or is part of the plan for independence to eventually incorporate uh, Kirkuk. The second question is, uh, you had talked earlier about this, the idea that, that you want the, the break from Baghdad to be an amicable, amicable yes, one. Yes. And as part of that, I, I was wondering if sharing the proceeds of, or sharing the future proceeds of oil from Kirkuk uh, would be, uh, w with Baghdad would be part of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the, um, uh, that two questions. Uh, that's a uh, PUK leader who, you know, that, that the word was around that he asked for the special states of Kirkuk is the governor of Kirkuk, it's Najib Nikarim, but he recently spoke with Rudaw and he mentioned that I never meant that, you know, it's a, uh, and today President Barzani was in Kirkuk and uh, with Najib Nikarim and uh, he had a very important meeting with the Peshmerga commanders in Kirkuk. Uh, Kirkuk geographically, historically has been part of Kurdistan. In all elections since 2005, Kurdistani bloc won the majority of Kirkuk's vote. So definitely Kirkuk will be part of that Kurdistan uh, state that we have. But within the constitution of Kurdistan, as I said, we believe in this multi-ethnic pluralism nature of our society that we have. So we don't, we don't have any objections within Kurdistan that the governor of Kirkuk to be a Turkmen or an Arab or a Turkmen be a vice president in Kurdistan or even in any kinds of the positions. So if that can be regarded that as the Kurds, we guarantee the power sharing with the components of Kirkuk as a special status, we don't have any problem with that. The second for the, with the amicable break, yes, definitely. For us, the soil of Kirkuk and the areas is important, not the, the rest of the oil of Kirkuk. We are shipping Kirkuk's oil right now through Kurdistan region. And when we say about the amicable, if we call it the amicable divorce with Baghdad, definitely the issue of uh, oil, the issue of currency, for example, you know, we are not going to break away completely with Iraq. An integrated economy, a common defense pact together, and to live together and to face the challenges that is facing them and us. And also we are contributing to what will be the future of the Sunnis after Kurdistan breaks away from Iraq. Because as I said, the most important thing we want to add to stability in the areas to help the process. It's not to say, okay, the house is on the fire, I'm living, and I don't care about those who are staying there. Anybody else? Question? Yes, please. Hi, Dirk Hoffman, Department of State. Um, could you say a little bit more about what kind of political arrangement you would envision for the Sunnis, not just in Iraq, but beyond uh, Syria as well? In, for the Sunnis? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, first of all, the most important thing that I think we all have to collectively work on it is to identify who are the prominent Sunni leaders and to lead the Sunni community. And if you find some, please let us know to coordinate with. Because this is the issue that the Sunnis are without leaders who are in touch with their constituency. And they, they, the legitimate leaders who can and represent the Sunnis. So, but the most important thing is that to train and arm the Sunni moderates and we are doing that. We are providing two military camps for the Sunnis in Iraqi Kurdistan region, but the Iraqi government has not provided with enough arms to them. So prepare the Sunnis, support them for the Mosul operation, for the areas step by step, liberate their own areas, do governance in their areas, and make sure that, because one of the questions and the concern that the Sunni has is that between ISIS and the militias, which one is, is better? They say that neither is better. So we have to give them this assurance that when they liberate their areas, it will be them themselves who are running their own areas. Because the post-ISIS question, they are very concerned about this post-ISIS question. So the best thing is to collectively work on it, to pre prepare these leaders who are on the ground with them, to give them assurances that whenever your area is liberated, you yourself will do policing, governing everything, and protecting your own areas. And we will provide you with any kind of the support that you need. Brent Wallace, I'm a student. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My question is about the referendum yes. that you proposed. Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a national consensus since 1987. Uh, how would a referendum would a referendum require uh, a new census, a new, a new counting of the population in any way? Yeah, it's true that there has not been because it, we worked very hard in the Iraqi Parliament, and even we passed that law. But Maliki, again, they didn't commit to do the census in Iraq. It's a law. It has been passed in 2000, if I'm not to the top of my head, if I remember, it was in either 2009 or 10. The question is that we have the voting list of all the elections that the IHAC has held in, since 2005, so we can use that for the referendum as well. Rahim Rashidi, the Kurdistan TV, Iraq is a very important part of the Sunni Kurda, the ideology, the government of the United States, the American and the truth of the United States. So the question that Iraq is, always, is now divided into three places, why the United States is not accepting this reality. Uh, <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, State Department, can you answer them? So. <laughs> uh, United States has been a great ally of Kurdistan region, and we have excellent relationship right now, and we are doing a lot of coordinations on any on, on, on of the steps that we have, because the United States, as I said, is an indispensable ally for us, and uh, we are not going to do things without consultations, and uh, uh, this is important. But for the United States also, the facts on the ground that Iraq is now divided. Iraq is now fragmented. So any policy to deny this reality, this fragmented Iraq, is not helping for the contingency planning for more stability in the areas. Iraq right now in the Shiite areas, the Shiites are fighting to draw their borders. And we are fighting to defend our borders as well. So we have collectively to work also with the Sunnis to protect their borders. So this question, again, it's for them, for the United States, but we definitely in good coordination with them and we are trying our best in, in, in sharing information, in staying together, and in coordination in order to have a better understanding on the situation and how to go forward. One final question from the overflow room, Madeleine, um, or Madeleine International Foundation for Electoral System. Her question is, you said that the IDPs must go home. Will they not be able to stay, especially Sunni Kurds that have been excluded, Sunni, Sunni and Kurds, yeah. that have been excluded and this if disenfranchised from areas like Nineveh. Yeah. Uh, as I said, the best solution for these people, for the refugees and IDPs after the solution of ISIS, is to go back to their own areas. But we are not imposing on them to go back, and that's because if it's not secure, how to go back? And the Iraqi Kurdistan region has been very receptive. It's very open, and uh, we are welcoming them. But as I said, we don't have enough resources to provide them with all the needs that they have. And because of this financial embargo that Baghdad put it on us because of the lack of resources that we have. So any international support 
to provide health with KRG in order to support those people that are more welcome and we don't have any problems with them. In fact, I'm going to ask the last question, <laughs> and that has to do with KRG relations with Israel. And uh, mm -hmm. part of the concerns that have been voiced by some camps inside Tehran is that an independent KRG will become an Israeli outpost in the neighborhood. Okay. And, um, that, and that concern goes back, way back, to what they think is, ben, you know, to what they attribute to Ben Gurion's periphery theory, and mm -hmm. that the Kurds are, you know, one such group that mm -hmm. the Israelis have always reached out to to create these settlements to break mm -hmm. that wall of Sunni Arabs mm -hmm. that surround them. So, in the event of independence, uh, what will be KRG relations with Israel and vis-a-vis -vis issues of the region? Yeah. First, uh, we, have, we don't have any sensitivity toward any nation, toward any country, including Israel. And to be very honest with you, second, we have a long border with Iran. Geography is not going to change. So yes, number one policy is the regional policy for Iraqi Kurdistan region. The third issue, Iraqi Kurdistan is not going to pose any threat and is not allowing anyone to use Iraqi Kurdistan to pose threats to other countries if the Iranians are concerned with that. The third issue is that we in Iraqi Kurdistan region, we want to have our own independent policy, not to be part of any agenda of any other regional countries. Or for example, we don't, we, we never ever be part of Iran's agenda that Iraqi Kurdistan should stay and uh, be against this. And we don't want to be part of any other agendas to use Iraqi Kurdistan against Iran or Turkey or any other country. Iraqi Kurdistan wants to add to stability in the area. And as I said, we, we don't have any sensitivity toward any country, toward our people, and we are very proud that by history, Kurdistan is so tolerant, and many Jews who were in Kurdistan, who are in Israel right now, they are just have good relations with the Kurdish people, with the Kurdish community. And again, we don't have any problem, any sensitivity toward any country, but Kurdistan region is independent in its policy, and it's not an extension of any of the regional countries, and will not be and Kurdistan region will be partner with Iran, with Turkey, and with the other countries. Thank you very much. Really join me in thanking uh, Hamin in a really tour de force. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.